So this is the final in a four part series presentation. We're gonna look at the survivalist approach, which is probably the worst out of the three. We looked at the um, high culture, the contributionism perspective, that looked at Africans in high culture, civilization, their contribution, achievements, accomplishments. Then we looked at the catastrophic perspective, and that was looking at colonization, it was looking at enslavement, etc. Now we're going to be looking at resistant movements and elements of genocide. It's not going to be gruesome. There will be some lynching pictures maybe shown at the end if we have time, just to reinforce what survivalist perspective that Ando, Orlando Patterson put forward really and truly means. So I think it's important for us to understand things from, you know, from our perspective, here there's just the three approaches, like I said. Today's a survivalist approach is looking more at slavery, slavery, resistance, emancipation, abolition. That's what it's really looking at. It's looking where Africans or black people in the Western world are now fighting back for their so-called freedom. So this is what this presentation will focus on. So Asa Iliad. He's an educational psychologist, chemistologist, you know, he studies black Egypt classical black Egypt, and he's also a historian. This is what he says, and this is something I always like to use this quote because I feel it's really important for us as, uh, as black people and for those of us who are white people as well to understand black history within their historical experience in the past. I think this is really important here uh, because black people have been invisible in many, many historical spaces as far as history is concerned and we've been omitted deliberately. And I think it to give context to the content, we need to acknowledge that we have had a relationship together for hundreds, even thousands of years. He says that there's something dreadfully wrong with an education socialization process that leaves us ignorant of our past, strangers to our people, apes of our oppressors, and creatures of habitual shallow thoughts and trivial values. What I want to focus on is looking at education. When he talks about the aspect of education, he's looking at the educational system. What is the educational system, system doing for us to learn more about our past? Okay, more about our present state because we're only in our present state because of what took place in the past. Okay, history is not about sets of events that took place and has no relevance with the contemporary situation that we find ourselves in. They're all related. So looking at the educational system and the fact of the matter to this. When you go to college, universities, you have to put that additional work in. Don't expect that your 45 minutes or 50 minute seminars or lectures or your, um, you know, anything like that is going to su suffice you. You got to put that literal li li that work in. For every hour lecture that you have in college or university, you know you got to put at least three or four hours in just to take additional notes, to get context of the content that was delivered, understanding the pedagogy and how that relates to the material, how you can try to elaborate further. This is what it's about, education. So it's not just about a teacher delivering, you go home, you know, thank you. You know, you've got to put that work in. And socialization looks at the element of what takes place within the home. So education takes place in the home. Okay, socialization, what they call primary socialization. We also have to look at the secondary forms of socialization as well, such as things like social media, such as the television, such as films and movies and magazines and tabloids, you know, all these different things socialize us and gives us a particular fr frame of thinking. The process leaves us ignorant of our past. If you don't know about your past, you're going to become strangers to your people, strangers to the people around you, especially if you've been living with them for thousands of years, maybe even strange to your own people. And it's not just looking at things from a black perspective, it's looking at things from an individual perspective. History is really important for us to know and to navigate ourselves into a more profitable future. So what has happened now with the series, the catastrophic is ended now, survivalist approach. So this is a catastrophic stage of what's taking place. We're going to move, slowly move into survivalist stage. So the Moors have lost power in 1492. And this is the time that Christopher Columbus is going to go out on his so-called many, many journeys in order to so-called discover the new world. 
I've already emphasized in the first week or two that there was an African presence in America two centuries before Columbus. His name was Abu Bakr II. He came from the Empire of Mali and he left between 1307 to 1312, leaving his brother Mansa Khan Khan Musa in charge of the empire. Um, Mansa Musa is the richest man that's ever lived. This is what is recorded. He was a Muslim, he was a Mandinka, and he controlled this massive empire in West Africa. So Columbus has gone out on his journeys, and now you start to see the likes of Balboa, Balboa, Cortes, and all these other individuals, the conquistadores, they're going in, occupying the so-called New World. So Isabella and Ferdinand are now given the keys of Granada, uh, which is the city, the last stronghold of the Moors or the Muslims. And um, this now is where Muslim or Moorish control is now over. This is at the beginning of the Spanish Inquisition, which many people, if they don't conform to Catholicism, etc., they are going to end up, at, uh, end up being tortured badly or dying if they resist. And so it's all around, so a lot of things have changed in the world, and this is what begins the modern world of Europe, okay? Spain is a first nation state, and it has immense amount of power. We've also talked about the Treaty of Tordesillas that takes place about a year or two after Spain and Portugal become war with one another. The Pope decides to split the world into two, he gives half the world to Portugal and half the world to Spain. So from this line here, if we're looking at the equatorial lines from here, it falls into Brazil. Brazil is Portuguese speaking. That's what's given to the Portuguese, Africa, Asia. All beyond these lines here was given to Spain. It's why a lot of these countries today are Spain, Spanish speaking. Other countries with Dutch speaking or English speaking or French speaking is because they came in later as far as the slave trade is concerned. That's why these people are speaking in those particular languages. So if you look at Jamaica, Jamaica was a Spanish colony that was taken from them by the English in 1655. And that's how the language changed and that's how that colony changed. So Europeans are fighting for one another, etc. What the Muslims or the Moors created in Spain is now being destroyed. Those are being destroyed, brings in, ushers in the Renaissance, the Enlightenment period in Europe. This is a historical fact. So you can see how things are interconnected, even if people historically do not want to quote their sources or who were the custodians before they came on the scene. So let's have a look at the Asiento. Now the Asiento de Negros was contracts that Spanish and the Pope was given to other nations to take slaves from Africa. Slaves are only taken from Africa by the Spanish, but Spain couldn't go in there because that was Portuguese territory. This is important to you, it's Portuguese territories. So what happened, Spain was given what was known as asiento, licenses or contracts, France, Britain, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Germany, and Italy. These are some of the nations that were getting these contracts as buccaneers or privateers, depending if they work for their, for, for their government or their monarchies, et cetera, to go into Africa to steal free people to enslave them. And that was because Charles V commissioned in 1517 between 4,000 and 15,000 slaves to come into the new world because he has this massive empire and he needs to cultivate it because at that time there was a shortage of food within Europe. 1517 was also the beginning of the uh, Reformation. So you've got two major issues or two major events taking place at this time. I talked about the Songhai Empire, which was the largest empire in West Africa. That falls in 1591, when the Portuguese decided to come in as mercenaries with the Moroccans, came in and destroyed the University of Timbuktu. It brought its scholars into, in, in, into chains back to Morocco at that time. And security was lost in West Africa. And this is how the Asiento was able to exploit that lack of security in taking away so-called prisoners of wars who are now going to be made in slaves, made the slaves. It's historically inaccurate for us to say slaves were taken from Africa. This is not true. Slaves were not taken from Africa. Free people were taken from Africa and then made slaves. 
Even if people want to say, well, slaves were taken from Africa, they were actually prisoners of war because it was internecine warfare within the empire. The empire just crumbled. People are trying to retrieve their land, territories. They're trying different tribes. They're trying to gain hegemony over other tribes because the tribe that controlled the empire wasn't really liked or respected or whatever the case may be. This is what's taking place and this is what's happening. Britain not really coming to the scene until as, until as early as the 1600s, but it's in 1555 when you start to see where Britain starts to gain some sort of access into this trait. So here's just images of slaves going into the Middle Passage, and this is going to be about survival now. They're going to be locked in the Middle Passage. They're going to be chained down. They may be on the ocean for two months, three months, four months. There's even some records I've read with some ships on, on, on the Atlantic for six months. Vomiting, urinating, sicking, you know, um, sweating, eating defecating, urinating, you could think of all those things. That was happening to these individual people, okay? Many of them couldn't speak the same languages because they came from different areas, etc. They wanted to reduce group unity in order for them to maintain hegemony over these people when they get off in the New World, the Caribbean Islands, and North America in order to develop though develop and cultivate those lands for European markets now because the Moors have controlled those markets for approximately 800 years. So they have to create a slave now. So we're looking at the concept of determinism. Determinism is a concept in sociology which basically means where the person lacks agency or autonomy. It's paternalistic in its approach which means you are a social actor. You have to read from a script. You've got to conform to a script. So you have a lack of agency. And this is what it was like for black people. So in order to create the slave, which is now called a Negro, because before they were called Negroes, they were called Moors. Moors is a word that means dark skin, black, you know, um, swarthy, whatever you want to call it. It's a descriptor, it's an adjective. That's what more meant. More people think that more means Muslim. No, the word more was used 700 years by Europeans before Islam even comes into existence. So it's important to know, pay attention to chronology, know who was who, because this is where a lot of distortion is going to take place now. They're not going to attribute Al-Andalusia and those North African monuments and architectural designs to these people. And this is how they change the narrative by changing names. So in order for us to understand how to create the slave, you have to take control of the slave's language. So there are things in sociological understanding known as social constructs. Those things that create culture. So culture is based upon language, beliefs, morals, customs, norms, values, and mores. All those things are culture, which comes together. So language is a form of communication, whether it's verbal or nonverbal forms of communication. So what you'll find now, we were not allowed to speak our languages, whether it was Arabic or Yoruba or Wolof, Akan, whatever the case may be. And now we have to speak the languages of, in this case, just for focus on the English, because you know many of like the French, many people speak French, many Blacks speak Dutch, and whatever the case may be. And the next thing, they had to take away the religious aspect, which meant that spiritual elements with that religion was taken over. So, and it was replaced with another type of religion. But unfortunately, they couldn't keep it. They wouldn't allow us to embrace Christianity because you're not supposed to enslave another former Christian or fellow Christian. So keeping us as infidels made it easy for them to justify how they were treating us. Then our customary practices change, our dress, we ended up in the New World but naked. This was to give the impression to the people who were on the shores or the seafront or the auction markets, that we were savages and barbarians. This is the whole point of doing it. And obviously to wash off many of the slaves, because if you're in a ship sitting in urine and feces and vomit and menstruational blood and all these other type of things, you're not going to smell well. So they had to wash off the slaves, etc., And they didn't have particular size of, you know, for shirts or trousers, or whatever the case may be to, 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 to give to these individuals. So they literally went to the auction block naked. So this is a form of humiliation. This is, well, you know, this is a form of humiliation. Our names were changed. 
If you look at West Indians or African Caribbeans in Britain, if you notice, we share the same surnames of the people of the British Isles. Our first names are mainly European, but our surnames, we've got names like Williams and O'Brien. We've got names like Macintosh. You know, we've got names like Marley. You know, we've got names like, you know, you know, and the names just literally go on and on. You get the drift. So that's what happened. And that is because you now was going to be owned by that particular family. So any black person with a surname such as Williams, it meant either two things, either his father going back a few generations, which came from maybe Wales or Scotland or England, depending on where they came from, you know, had that name, had a child with a African or a black woman, which may have been the product of rape. Okay. And that child would have carried that name. Another as if he was a planter, he would have actually owned all those slaves on the plantation who carried his name. He became, she became, they became properties for that name. This is why the likes of Malcolm X changed his name because he was a slave. Little is a slave owner's name is an Irish family's name who owned his family. That's why he changed it. And that's why you find what's happening as a form of survival for black people in the Western world to disassociate themselves from determinism. Yeah. In other words, what was imposed upon them because the migration was forced. It was forced migration. Relationships were also controlled. Occupations would have changed. Back in Africa, many of them were scholars and doctors and surgeons and physicians. Many of them were librarians. You know, many of them were teachers, professors. You know, many of them were blacksmith, carpenters, builders. You know, they had a society that came from a huge empire, which lasted a few centuries. So just to say, because they came in naked, they couldn't read or write. They may not be able to read English or French or Dutch or German, but they certainly were able to read their languages, not their script or many of the Arabic script. So this is important for us to understand and important for us to know. Relationships, you were not allowed to get married. Marriage was a sacred thing with amongst African people and the British people denied us this, this right. Okay, and this is one of the problems which we had in trying to develop ourselves as families because our families were owned by the slave owners, by the planter class, by the planter, plant, planter's family. So we had very little agency in bringing up, raising a family. Identity was basically changed, and as far as education was concerned, our education was non existent. If you were caught reading and writing, you were basically either flogged by the 30, 40, 50, maybe up to 70 lashes, maybe to 100 lashes, or you were executed. This is what it was. So from 1492 onwards, we were denied an education. And even if you look at what took place after the American Civil War, when the 30th Amendment was passed and black people tried to develop themselves as agents and individual citizens within that social development of integration within society they were still being denied right up until the 1950s you see the hostilities when the segregation educational system came and how hostile white people were towards black people gaining education so you can see that education would have given us some sort of liberty or freedom so i think i may have shown this the only thing which i want to emphasize here are just two points in 1555, the English Queendom began to take interest in the New World. And this is when mass consumption came to the UK from, 55, from 1555 onwards. So what we're beginning to find out is that um, a lot of different spices are coming here. Ivory is coming here. Not just slaves and all, you know, not just slaves, but a lot of other forms of objects or commodities or merchandise. And it was developing the aristocracy. And in 1580, this is when Britain really puts its stamp on things under the concept known as the principles of effective occupation, which meant if you could occupy a land in the, in the Americas or even on the coast of Africa, you can take that. That would be part of my queendom and it would be part of our empire. And the fact of the matter is, as long as it doesn't cause problems with either Spain or Portugal or France or Holland, whatever the case may be, that is part of our realm. So this is what, this was the British initiative that took place in the late part of the 1600s or late part of the 16th century going into the 1600s. 
Then you have the likes of John Hawkins that left. He brought slaves back to Britain. He was commissioned by um, Queen Victoria, no, Queen Elizabeth, sorry, to go and to take slaves back to the UK. And obviously he was knighted as we got the word Sir John Hawkins. The ship was called the Good Ship Jesus and it's called Jesus Christ. So the first people to come over here was on the ship named Jesus. So this is important for us to know that religiosity still played an important role within British society. However, an element of cognitive dissonance would have to have taken place. You have to see these people less than human, inhuman, whatever the case may be, in order for an individual to justify the position that they are in, in order to maintain this horrific and barrack system. So here it is just to reinforce the, the um, way in which the upper class groups within the Caribbean and within um, North America were situated. These are the three top groups of whites, your planters, your merchants, and your men of profession. So when we look at the likes of Picton, which they talked about where they took his uh, statue out of, um, what do you call it, in town, one of the things is, is that if we look at um, Picton, he was a planter. Yeah, this plantation was in Trinidad, etc. He's a horrific planter. The way he treated his people on the plantation was totally horrific. He even killed people on his plantation. The merchant like Colston that came out of Bristol, that's what he was. He was traded in slaves, okay? Import and export, looking at merchandise, materials, commodities and resources, you know, interchanging that uh, transatlantic link from North America to Britain, Caribbean to Britain, and who they were sending to other European nations because they had hegemony or control or authority over some of those raw materials which are being produced in the Americas. And Americas also includes the Caribbean islands. Then you have the men of profession, which is your more educated class, and they were more your government officials, you know, your doctors, administrators, but they were also slave owners at the same time. So you're going to see this was known as a slaveocracy. This is a slaveocracy, these groups of people. I have talked about the poor whites that came over, et cetera, but I'm not going to focus on them. I'm just going to focus on the hierarchical structure amongst white people from Britain who was in the so-called new world and what positions that they held while they were ruling those particular vicinities or countries at that time. Then we got the colored people or the three blacks. So the colored people, your mixed race types, okay? So this is important, so your mixed race types. They were usually the products of white males, black females, usually through rape. So that was a horrific system. This is what took place at that time, because not many white women from Britain was going to the Caribbean islands. It's just like if you look at the history of seamen, who do they come? They don't come over with their wives, they come over with single men and they marry local women. Okay, this is what happens. So if you go back into antiquity or back into ancient history, whatever the case may be, you will see a similar occurrence taking place. Then you had free blacks who were a minority within the American societies. And the Americas, I'm talking about the Caribbean islands as well. Okay, they would have purchased their freedom or monumented from their slave owners, whatever the case may be. But if you wanted freedom, you can afford freedom. You can only get that if the slave owner wanted to release you. You just couldn't just give up freedom when you wanted. Then we have the slaves population, which are categorized into four. I've talked about this, but I just want to focus on two. The mechanics, which is the backbone of Western society, which have held the slaveocracy system. The plantocracy, and what these were, you know, so the slaveocracy system was a system of slavery and the plantocracy of the so-called planters. We didn't plant really anything. They were just sitting on land which was owned by the monarchy in this country. Some of them actually purchased that land because of merchant class, giving them titles and all these other type of things, because we know these lands in the Americas were stolen. And then we got the field hands, is which a lot of people like to focus on. And one of the things I want to emphasize is the importance of looking through black history through all different lenses. And that is what I've showed you over the last four weeks. Unfortunately, within British society or Western society, they like to focus or start black history off in slavery and nothing else. They are fascinated with this. 
And the reality is our history is about far much more than that. To lock us in this 500 year room is totally unfair. Put us in a six or 700 year room, you see a different outcome, you see different people. And this is what they want to refuse us from knowing or having. So I want you to uh, look at the slave system and look at the different roles that men and women of color would have played within the plantocracy of the Americas. Then we got this individual here, Carl Linnaeus. He was a anthropologist, a botanist, etc. And this is the sort of things where they're going to characterize uh, black and white people. He's divided races into four categories. We're just going to be looking at two. Homo Europaeus as white, fickle, sanguine, uh, blue-eyed, gentle, and governed by law. So they are civilized. The Homo Afa, who is the black or the so-called African, okay? They are cunning and lazy and lustful, you know, careless and governed by caprice. In other words, as far as their emotional state is concerned and their psychological state is concerned, they are very highly capricious. In other words, there's a sudden change in their mood and behavior. Okay, you don't know where you stand with dark-skinned people. So they're shifting, you shouldn't trust them. This is what he's saying. And this is then going to be adopted by people within Western philosophy. But the thing I want you to look at is this concept of lazy. Look at the amount of money these merchants make by sitting on their backside and delegating. So how could, they, how could Africans be lazy? And lustful was to justify the rape which was taking place on the plantations. Because, you know, the majority of the people, that, the majority of the children, and women that were killed on the plantations were killed by white women through their jealous rage because of what their husbands or brothers or fathers or cousins were doing to these enslaved women. So when you have the aspect of lustful coming in, you will find that if you read some of the narratives by a lot of these white women who own plantations, this is how she described the black women on the plantation. They were lustful. Okay, oversexed or undersexed, etc. In order to, it was like a cognitive dissonance of putting rape behind, oh, my husband is not raping her. They knew their husband was raping these women on the plantation. We've seen the film 12 Years a Slave. It's a prime example. The wife is physically abusing the woman and the man is sexually abusing the woman. This is how it was like. They were taught to chambers. In at this particular period. So when you've got educated men of the profession saying things like that, it's justified to the plantocracy who were engaged in these type of practice, who are religious men, that it's okay, it's their fault. Okay, okay, you're the victim, they're the perpetrators, they deserve to get this. And this is what I wanted to emphasize where this point is concerned. So let's have a look at some of the things that takes place within. Uh, American society, where you're going to have mind doctors or psychiatrists, you know, Benjamin Rush, where they is known as the father of psychiatry. And they're going to use these different type of people to justify the behavior of planters. But what I want you to understand about Benjamin Rush, he was an abolitionist, okay? He's an abolitionist. He is known, he's now the father of psychiatry, uh, who then believed that black skin was a manifestation of leprosy that he called negritude. So negritude is black skin. This is what he diagnosed, okay? And this was in the 1700s. And the way of solving this problem was to violently rub this away. He believed if black people were to rub for a long period of time, that it would, it would come off. This is what was believed. And pushing this into the psyche of white people in America, because it doesn't want this one in America, North America. They even transported this, this thing was transported even to the Caribbean islands and even to slaves that was in Britain. So what you started to see, there was this element of segregation in its early stages it started. Because it was believed if white people were in close proximity, okay, with black people, they would get this nigritude, this, this dark skin. This is why when many of us were in school in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, even teachers were licking their fingers to see if our skin would come off our face. They thought it was negritude. They, they really did. They thought we were white people underneath that. They really did. And this is the educated class within this country. 
Okay, so Benjamin Rush was a sign of the Declaration of Independence, but he was also an active abolitionist. So people will think, well, how can he be for the freeing of slaves, but yet he's trying to keep them in servitude? He was also an abolitionist who owned slaves. And this is the hypocrisy behind this system where certain people, because he only must have been an abolitionist to know where to put his wealth, to oversee what was gonna happen because they knew that with a lot of slave rebellions that were taking place in America, that things were going to drastically change. And if things were gonna drastically change, they needed to put their money into new investments. So many abolitionists who, and I, I'm not saying that he was a racist, you know, but there must have been some form of race, you know, racialized attitude there. There had to have been. Yeah, he must have, he was affected by the society that he was in. Okay, and he was certainly affected by the by the amount of money he was getting in justifying these negative things towards black people from the plan to class, because that's what psychiatry, psychiatry in, in that day, in the 1700s and the 1800s, were in bed with the plantocracy. They were in bed with the merchants, and they were also in bed with the men of profession who were slaveholders. This is where they earned their money from. So they would have to have said this in order to get you know, some, pay, some payment, but to lie, about the state of black people just to make the three individuals feel good about who they were, what they were, and what they were actually doing. So this is what came out with the likes of Benjamin Rush, who was supposed to be the father of psychiatry. Then you've got the likes of Samuel Cartwright, who's another individual who was a mind doctor, he's a psychiatrist, etc. But all I want to emphasize with this individual that he's another abolitionist as well. So he starts to believe this concept. His rationale was that black skulls were 10% smaller than European skulls. So it was cognitive deficiency and intellectual, based upon intellectual act, uh, activities. This is what was believed about his intellectual inferiority. Even though they had created empires in Mali, empires in Songhai, the Moorish Empire in most of Africa, from West Africa to North Africa, into the Iberian Peninsula, right up into France, etc. You know, that these people are, you know, dumb, trying to disassociate this from the cultures and the high cultures and civilization that were created before. But in order to control an individual or a slave, you had to inferioritize them in some way, make them into animals or less than what they're supposed to be. So this is what happens, and these people became the experts on our being, the experts of our mind, the experts of our behavior, only to justify to planters, men of the profession, and the merchant class, that what they were doing was okay, and the sickness is within these people, not you. It's them with sicknesses. And then he came up with the concept of drapetomania, which basically meant, you know, it comes from a word, a Greek word, which means to run away crazy, a crazy person who runs away. So if you are being treated bad on the plantation, you run away, that's a mental illness. It's called drapetomania. Cartwright also discovered and described a host of imaginary black diseases, yeah, whose principal symptoms seem to be a lack of enthusiasm for slavery. Okay, so we had a lack of enthusiasm for slavery, so we have a mental illness, which means we are supposed to be pre, pre, predisposed to slavery. Slavery is supposed to be an innate, inherited, and natural thing for dark-skinned people. And this is what was coming out of these sciences. So you will start to see where different things started to emerge itself. So you started to see where anthropology was doing there a little bit. Anthropology is founded by colonial administrators. Psychiatry and psychology are putting their bit in. Religion with the curse of Ham, it was putting hit stuff in. You know, science is now being used to do hit stuff. So all these different subjects and disciplines are there to try to justify to the planter class, to the men of profession, and to the merchant class of white people within the so-called Americas that what they're doing is okay, and the sicknesses in which Daskian people have, it's, you know, there's no need to worry about that. You carry on doing what you're doing. So for Draper to Mania, what well, Samuel Cartwright believed, this is, uh, this is from the film Django, okay? So the cure for Drury Trypotomania was to whip the devil out of them. So to whip them for running away. That will cure them from running away. Is that going to cause people to want to stay or, you know, or like to stay? 
This is what came out of this reality. So you started to see where people who are claimed to be abolitionists are trying to say that we need them in order to, to survive. Because it was a belief by Cartwright where he believed that our freedom would not suffice us because we were babies. We needed white people, you know, to supervise us. This is what he believed. So it's contradictory in a way. You're an abolitionist, but you want to give us freedom. But if we're free, we don't we lack agency because we're little babies and we need white people to supervise us. And this is permeating and pervasive within those three classes of slave owners, the planters, the men of profession, and the merchant class. So from here, from as early as the 1850s, psychiatry was in bed with the plantocracy. So that's where they're getting their money from, okay? Because it was a money-making industry. Justify the physical abuse of black people as a solution to, to eradicate or to reduce the psychological or physical ideas of abandoning slavery. So if black people want to abandon slavery, etc., there was something wrong with them. Not something wrong with the system, not something wrong with the planters, not something wrong with the men of profession, not something wrong with the merchants. This is what it was about. So it was about justifying the system. And these are just pictures when dogs were sent out, etc. what they would do. This is from the film Django. So all I'm trying to emphasize here is the importance of knowing how horrific this system was. We barely survived this. The branding, the face, cutting off of the ear. These are all the different things that took place in America and in the West Indies or the Caribbean islands when we tried to run away from the plantation. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see an individual by the name of Peter. This was his back, how it looked in 1863. This man had his back torn to pieces. This was acceptable behavior. And psychologists and psychiatrists were justifying this in some way. Maybe because he was insubordinate, he was trying to run away, or whatever the case may be. So these are just some of the things. And even it wasn't just confined to males, even females were branded in the face or had their ears cut off or were almost flogged, even flogged to death. Amputation, the cutting off of genitalia or the foot, or whatever the case may be, it was used. These were horrific systems. They can barely survive. Castration was as, as was normal. Physical executions with other slaves on the plantation being onlookers so to, 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 to uh, reinforce to them, this will happen to you if you try this. So you watch, you look at what we're doing. We're in control of this. So captured slaves, this is from the film Django again. Uh, an, examination, um, an examination of the way in which lynchings were conducted suggests an overriding sexual theme. Castration, sexual mutilation, and sexual, and sexual torture were common components, no matter what the alleged crime was. And I say alleged crimes, alleged crimes. And we see what's happening with the police force in this country towards the black community and obviously in the American community, even the police force in the Caribbean islands, how brutal they are, because they were trained by the British. Okay, they were trained by the Americans. They may have the same color as us, etc., but they have that type of mindset. You know, Wade Nobles once says that power is the ability to define someone else's reality and to have those people respond to that definition as if it was their own. So when you go to the Caribbean islands, you see this element of hostility where they criminalize particular groups of people. This was very common in the 60s and 70s and 80s with Rastafarians as an example, okay? They horrifically attacked by the police within the Caribbean islands. So the reality is, is that sometimes the people who come up with these, um, these training programs for officials, you know, or for soldiers, or for police forces, etc. They come from these type of barbaric systems that came together during the enslavement period. Then you got the likes of Samuel Cartwright. He came up with another concept, not just trichotomania, dysesthesia, Ethiopias, impaired sensation. Supposedly affected both mind and body of blacks, not whites, just blacks. What are the symptoms? Being disobedient, answering back disrespectfully and refusing to work. This is the mental condition that black people have. In a horrific system, 
um, living on the plantation, of being disobedient, answering back disrespectfully, and refusing to work. So the reality with this situation now is that they're coming up with all different types of diagnoses to justify slave owners' behavior because slave revolts are starting to take place, okay? Slave rebellions are starting to take place. Slave owners' houses and manors and mansions are starting to get burned. Black people who were enslaved or free people were not going to take this no more. They were really working us to death and trying to annihilate us under their so-called system. And this is important for us to know. The cure for this, this asthesia Ethiopius, okay, was hard labor. To work them harder, that was the cure, okay? We were almost worked to death after the act in 1807 was passed. So it is really important for us to know that um, it was to keep them in power. Many of them were coming back to Britain and buying themselves political power, okay? And, you know, they weren't politicians, but they were buying political power to ensure that parliament and all these other departments were ensuring that they were, um, what you call it, imposing um, different sort of rules or acts or legislations for them to be better people in a sense or more comfortable people under that system. This is why they'll buy in political power. So we look at the horrific system, what takes place uh, during slavery. This is looking at comfort girls where women were taken as so-called concubines or sex slaves and then thrown out. And sometimes the children that you're impregnated with by the slave owner or the overseer or whatever type of other role that they had on the plantation took the name of the, of the rapist. Can you just imagine this? They take the name of the rapist, these children, they've got to take the second name because it's probably owned by it. Um, she's probably owned by him. And then the child then is put into, into slavery. Okay, this is a horrific system. They are totally detached. Okay, where they're just, they're just having these women and playing with these women and using these women and abusing these women, pregnant them and leaving them. This is where the concept comes from. So when you see that taking place now, no, we could trace its roots. Because we know that a lot of these mixed race colored or mulatto children that were on the plantations, they were looked after, sometimes by the husbands of these women or the brothers of these women, okay? The historical documentation is there. So black men fathered, you know, raped victims, raped children and brought them up as their own. So a lot of this concept about black men not being good fathers, et cetera, well, we find maybe that's true, but where do they inherit this behavior from? because they didn't inherit this behavior when they came, when they were living in Africa. They only inherited this behavior when they came to the West. And the only people that was born for this behavior were your planters, your men of profession, and your merchants. So if I was to name people like Thomas Jefferson, if I was to name the person, if I was to name people like George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, they're prime examples. And you know the history about these individuals, how they treated these type of women on the plantation back then. Masters saw nothing of selling their beautiful slave girls into a life of shame. And there were special markets where the fancy girls, American call them comfort girls, the Caribbean fancy girls, as the, uh, those destined for this purpose were called, were sold. So sometimes they would just use them and just sell them onto another plantation. We know about the so-called buck farms and stud farms, where men were there just to breed. They were forced to rape other women to breed the next generation, especially after the Act of 1807. Because when they, when they passed the Act of 1807 to abolish the slave trade, there is a labor shortage in America and the Caribbean islands. And all of a sudden you start to see these stud farms and buck farms where men are there to rape women in order to produce the next generation of slaves. So even though Britain and America likes to talk about, well, the abolition of the slave trade, not slavery, the slave trade, what they're not telling their people in Britain and America, that there was a labor shortage and they were forced breeding women. Women literally were pregnant all around the earth. As soon as a girl started a menstrual cycle as early as eight, nine or 10, she now had to be known as being a woman. Then an older man, had to try to impregnate it to create the next generation of slaves because it was a labor shortage. So when they talk about and they glamorize the 1807 Act, know how horrific it was on the plantations in the Caribbean islands as well as North America. 
Then, obviously, this is taken from, these images are taken from the film Django. Concubinage, polygamy, Caribbean style. Three women of color, okay? The families, mothers, aunts, grandmothers, raise and train their girls for their future role as, concub as concubine. Beautiful, elegant, well-mannered, attractively groomed. Their, obje their object in life was to attract the most prestigious lover, a man with position and wealth, to set them up in their own houses. So now we're training our daughters now to become whores. This is what was happening. This is a horrific system, just for survival. This is all it was, just for survival. Just so they don't have to live the lifestyles that we had. And we're justifying this to ourselves. Just like how the, what you call the psychiatrists and the psychologists are justifying what's taking place, you know, in order to make the planters, the men of profession, and the merchants happy, we ourselves are doing a similar thing, okay? These are externalities. These are byproducts of an evil and barbaric and corrupt system. This is what this is about, okay? That we train our daughters in order to do this because she got lighter skin, for instance, because this is what it was. So it is easy to understand that we must put things in a historical perspective on how we should deal with these things perfectly. So I think we are going to stop here now. I think we'll have a break and we can continue. Yeah, if we stop and have about a five minute break and we can come back at about quarter past. Um, and any questions you guys have, just pop it in the Q&A box and Abby Backer will try and answer them at the end for you. Um, but about quarter past, if that's okay, and then we'll come back and rejoin. Right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. So I'll just give you a bit of a glimpse of what was taking place on the plantations in America. In order for you to understand why slave rebellions and slave revolts and insurrections and all these different things came about because the system in which black people lived in in the Western world was horrific, it was barbaric. So I'm just leaving you the foundations of why these resistant movements would come about. So let me just uh, see if I can change, is it pause? Okay, so here, great sale of slaves. And this was, I think this is in America, Okay, yeah, this is America, January the 10th, 1855. You can see there three bucks, age, uh, age from 20 to 26, strong, able bodied. This is for them to be sex slaves, one wench. This is someone who could be a comfort girl, one wench. This is a type of language which was being used at that particular time. Okay, and Liz, age 23, with six months old baby, old pickaninny. Okay, in Jamaica, we use the word picnic which is a concoction from Piccaninny, which was a derogatory term to call dark-skinned kids because their hair used to pick out because they didn't give us combs. Our hairs grew up and they went into little sort of like ringlets on top of the head, etc. And they would call us picks. You know, this is, this is where it came from. You know, the idea of Pickney or Piccaninny, etc. Okay, one buck. So this is all, they said, these are sex, this is a sex slave market now. This is a sex slave market. This is what I'm trying to show you here. And you will see a lot of other advertisements for auction for slaves. So black male, female relationships. So intimate moments by husbands and wives were usually observed by taskmasters and overseers, you know? So this is what, so our whole life was controlled by the plantocracy, literally, and the people who were further down in the pecking order your taskmasters and your overseers. Your taskmaster was the person who used to dispense the weapons and the beatings. Your overseer was like your head man making sure that, this, that you were doing your work. They would have a rifle trailed at you, et cetera, and they were usually on a horse. So now you understand the element of relationships of black people that came from traditional relationship where marriage was really important, et cetera, and marriage was now made legal for slaves. Okay, so the idea of fornication or illicit relationships became the norm on these plantations. Yeah, the children became property to the estate. So even if you were the father, you couldn't really raise your child because your child can be sold at any time. You had no agency or autonomy in the rearing of your own children. Men had to uh, endure 
their wives being raped by white overseers, etc. I'm trying to just emphasize the horrific system. That's all I'm trying to do. So these are just some images I want you to know that the abolition movement was trying to emphasize because remember there was a high illiteracy rate within Britain. So images and pictures were really important to bring home to people to support the abolition movement. This was, I think, in Jamaica. You know, a person thrown into a hot syrupy substance, boiling sugar, etc. These was a, these, this was normal behavior on a daily basis by the most sadistic individuals you can think of. And then you've got the, uh, you've got the uh, treadmill for punishing slaves, okay? And you can see where this treadmill literally would be spinning around, ripping the legs and the knees and some of the clothes off people, okay? This is, this is a horrific system. And where slaves sometimes would have to say, sit or stand and watch these horrific acts displayed in front of them. So we're gonna look at some resistant movements now, just to bring things up, because I want to lay the foundation of what type of system it was. I, tried, I didn't try to make it as graphic as possible, just give you a little taste of what was taking place. So the first real movement for change took place in Jamaica by the Maroons. And like I said, the Maroons are people that came from Al-Andalus, okay? They were known as Morescos. Okay, little Moors. And when they were brought over with, by Columbus and Balboa and all those individuals, they came with a place like Jamaica and Trinidad, Barbados, Grenada, and they went to the mountains and they formed settlements. And they came back in order to try, where they came back to try to, really, you know, to fight the British in order to release their brothers and sisters in captivity. So you've got the likes of Kudru, Okay, Taki, but Kudru and Nani, they're supposed to be brother and sister. Now, Nani the Maroon was a fierce warrior. She is believed by the British. The British said this woman was so feared, this Jamaican woman was so feared that when they would fire cannons at her, they used to say that she would catch it with her backside and fire it back. This woman was fierce. She actually coordinated jungle warfare. And the other thing I like to, I think, is information, which I've known for a long time, which most of you don't know, that Ho Chi Minh, who fought the Americans, okay, in the Vietnamese War, Ho Chi Minh was in America when Marcus Garvey, a Jamaican. Just a vegetable mix. Hello, I, I can hear someone. You need to mute. <laughs> Ho Chi Minh. talking about his dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the whole world knows now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't worry, I've muted him. I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay, so, I'm <laughs> Okay, so, uh, yeah, Nani the Maru. So Ho Chi Minh, when he was in America, he went to, one of, he went to Liberty Hall, one of Marcus Garvey's, who's a black nationalist, Marcus Garvey's meetings, where he heard about Nani the Maroon and the military strategy she used in the 1800s to defeat the British. And that is what he did. He was known as guerrilla warfare. And Ho Chi Minh brought that to Vietnam when he fought the Americans. And that is why the Americans lost. Guerrilla warfare is something that the Western soldiers or armies are unable to comprehend and win. And that's what he's able to do. And that is what Nani the Maroon did in the 1700s. And basically, uh, Kudru basically signed a treaty with the British between 1730-1739, making the Maroon community in Jamaica independent from the rest of Jamaica. But part of the treaty was that if any free men or women that ran from plantations came to their area, they'd have to send them back. And unfortunately, the Maroons would do that. And I can say that, you know, because I am a Maroon. I am descended of these people. And the reality is, is that they did have a conniving way of dealing with things, really. They were they're proud people, but they, they um, what's the word I'm looking for? They honored the contract they had with the British military in Jamaica. So this is how you're gonna to start to see changes now. So this is the first partial form of independence for black people in the so-called Western world. Right, so what we're going to do, we're going to look at abolition and emancipation. It's going to be a bit all over the place, but I wanted to understand the resistant movements from approximately 1807 to 1865. 1807 is when they passed the Abolition of the Slave Trade Act, not slavery. So when they passed 
the slave trade. It was to stop trading Africans in the new world. They still kept slavery. Slavery ended so-called in the Caribbean islands approximately 1883, uh, 18, um, 1833, 1834, okay, supposedly. America didn't end theirs until 1865, and that was after the American Civil War. So I'm going to combine the African-Caribbean experience with the African-American experience from a historical perspective. So let's look at the Haitian Revolution because the Haitians is the most successful republic, independent black republic that uh, came out of slavery. The Maroons begin to establish uh, an array of hope for all slaves all over the island. So in, eight, in, the, in, in the 1730s, in 1730, 1739, when the Maroons had managed to occupy a certain part of Jamaica and kept the British in fear. What started happening in other islands such as Trinidad and Barbados and Grenada, the St. Kitts and St. Lucia and St. Vincent, and the list just goes on. All those English speaking islands, they all have these great hopes for freedom now. If these slaves or former slaves or people who refuse to be slaves can fight, we will fight. So you had two men, Bookman and Mackendow. Bookman was actually from Jamaica and they sent him to Haiti because he was a problem. They called him Bookman because he was a man of the book. He would walk around with the Quran and it was believed that he actually read the Quran himself from memory. This is what is believed. But we do have evidence of many Muslims went over the slaves who read the Quran from memory, many of them. Some, one of them is actually in the British Museum. So he was a learned person and one hand man. So there's a possibility that his hand, his hands was amputated because of the kind of rebellions he was causing in Jamaica and the slave owner had to send him to another plantation. Um, they sold him to the French because if he was able to speak English to the other slave on the English speaking islands, they would rise up. Well, obviously, when he went to Haiti, many of them can speak some of the other dialects which he learned, also Arabic, and this is what caused it to happen. So he was the instigator. Mackendall, as well, was believed to believe another African Muslim ruler. And what I'm going to show you here is that majority in America and the Caribbean islands of those leads of resistance were religious people, whether they were Muslim, whether they were Christian or Jewish. Okay, they were leaders, they were people who should do sermons. This is what you're going to find out now. So there's an element of religious liberation that forces them to go back to the drawing board in order to liberate their people, to liberate their flock, their, you know, the flock of sheep. This is what comes out of these sort of ideas. So let's look at Toussaint, Toussaint Louverture, or Louverture. Okay, he was born into slavery. His father was believed to be a king and prince. However, just like only some slave owners, he was allowed to read and write. His master actually allowed, taught him to read and write and allowed him to read and write. So Toussaint Louverture had a different type of lifestyle. Okay, he was, he, was, he was quite different as a slave and he was treated pretty well, whatever the case may be. However, when the revolution came to head, he was scared for the slave owning family, mistreated him well. And he made sure that he got him out of Haiti before it erupted. Because he said, look, I'm going to join this rebellion movement. This is a revolution, okay? I'm in fear of you and your family. It's best if you go back to France. And this is what happened. And he also was taught medicine. And this is important. Many of the into the New World or to the Western world were medicine people. They were doctors. So they did medicine, if, um, surgery, physicianry, etc. So these are the important factors to know. So they're not just picking cotton and chopping down sugar cane. Okay, they had professions back in Africa and those professions were recognized sometimes, not all the time, sometimes, and they were used, usually to benefit the white aristocracy or the, the planter class, the plantocracy, who were well, your planters, your merchants and your men of profession. So let's have a look at this revolt because what happens is French are coming back, talking about liberté, liberté. They've just become a republic, okay? The 
Monarchy is now destroyed after the so-called French Revolution. They just liberated themselves and they're going back to Haiti talking about liberty, but they're still enslaving people. So this liberation was um, hip hypocritical. And many of the people in Haiti decided to rise up now. Okay, they've been trying to rise up now, but they collectivize. If these white Frenchmen who want to cause atrocities to us think that they're going to get away with it and come back comfortably, let them think again. So you've got the likes of Toussaint Rivertio, you've got the likes of Dessalines, you've got Henry Christophe. There's so many leaders and commanders, and they have a sophisticated system to bring all those black together. Even women were part of this movement as well. OK, in order to bring about change, because one thing they were going to make sure they're going to kick these French colonizers out who's been causing abuse. If you read the works by C.L.R. James, it's called Black Jacobins or Jacobins. You will look at the horrific way that the French were treating the blacks on the island of Haiti. They would put gunpowder into their rectums and light it. This is what they would do. They would force them. They, they had animals. They would collect the manure and starve the slaves and give them a new to eat. This is what the French were doing, okay? And I can go on even further, what they were drinking and what, honestly, it was absolutely disgusting. A rebellion was needed on this island. The way the French went too far with what they were doing. And the reality is the people had enough. So what is it? So here, um, so Toussaint joined the rebellion. He was a doctor for the resistance. So he started off as a doctor helping wounded soldiers. This is how he started off. But because he was educated, he was articulate, and people liked his nature. He actually made up the ranks and became basically the governor, okay, like a lieutenant governor of the island. Toussaint was loved by everyone who could appear in arms and resolve any situation. So literally this man can go anywhere if there's French and black Haitian fighters and he can go in arms and both sides would literally, you know, cease fire to allow him to come in to negotiate. So it took a very special person to come into this revolution to bring about change, okay? Louvois makes Toussaint the system governor because Louvois was sent in by Napoleon, because this is during Napoleonic Wars now, okay? Napoleon is holding to this, and he's taking bad advice from Josephine. A lot of people don't know that Josephine is from the Caribbean. She's mixed race. She has a hatred towards her people, and she's giving Napoleon advice to destroy these people. She does not want to acknowledge her black side. Even her and her sister used to have a lot of arguments. I can't remember the sister's name, Josephine's sister, because Josephine's sister was married to a black man from the Caribbean. So Josephine was giving him certain advice. She, she had a sense of self-hatred with the black blood that she had. And the way she was flaunting herself in French circles when Napoleon was on his thing was showing that she was looking for approval from white society. You have to look at it from a Caribbean perspective of what took place with um, mulattoes or colored females when they were in these type of arenas. Just like I read to you about how they trained black women in the Caribbean or colored women in the Caribbean to become, you know, whatever the case, whatever words you want to use. It happened in the French speaking islands, it happened in the Spanish speaking islands, it happened in the Dutch speaking islands in the Caribbean. Girls were cultivated in order to become like sex servants and slaves to get what they want. And Josephine comes from that tradition. That's why she was doing what she was doing and caused Napoleon to do some of his wars through what he was hearing. So you've got mulattoes fight against the blacks. So you have a large mulatto or colored population in Haiti. Okay. And they take up the resistance. But the problem is, is because their fathers are white Frenchmen, etc., they start to want to have some sort of concession of allowing the French to stay there. So Toussaint's forces and the likes of Dessalines and Henry Christophe decided to go into regard, I think the area it is called, and they had to put down the rebellion of these mulattoes who wanted French sovereignty in a way to maintain in, in, in the country while they were still so-called slaves. And he had to crush that, literally. So it's unfortunately that the mixture of the colored population had to go to war because what Toussaint had reasoned that if we do not put them down, we're fighting them on the front, they will join the French forces because their father's the French, they got sympathy to France and all these other type of things. 
Southernax became the new governor now, said to kill all whites. So Southernax becomes a new governor after Louvois. And Southernax is basically telling Toussaint to kill all the white people. And what happened was the likes of Toussaint and Henry Christophe and all these other main commanders and leaders said, we need to get rid of this idiot because this idiot is going to cause more problems because it's not as if we hate white people, we hate their system. And they can take their system back to France with them. So South Anax was there to cause a lot of problems. You've had a few times in history where white people have been so-called sympathetic towards the black struggle and they have said that we should kill them all, not even to trust them. There's even one which they said, well, don't even trust me because I'm from these people because we never keep our treaties and we never abide by contracts. We had many of these different individuals that came at these crucial times and Southernax is one of those individuals. So Sam sent Southernax home and took control of the region, okay? So he kicked him out because you're gonna cause more trouble. And uh, what trouble Southernax should bring to the island? So the fact is that, South Nax was making it a black and white thing when the revolution was about a slave and a white and, and, and white aristocracy. That's what it was about. It was about the system, not about skin color. And this is one of the reasons why Toussaint was advised to send his idiot home because he's going to cause more problems than what it is because we can win this war. He later began to create his own army, which led to 100 disciplined soldiers who he had trained well in combat, military strategy. He then increased his number after victory came. So as soon as he went from one place to another, more and more people started to follow, follow suit. Many of them began to train. They, made, they ended up making women, they ended up training women to train other women in order to fight the French. This is what happened. This was the most successful slave rebellion on the island. And this is how it was systematized. There was good communication. There was great understanding. They made sure they appointed the right people for the jobs in order to drive the French out. Because what the French had been doing since they took the island off the Spanish was totally horrific. The Spanish weren't even any better as slave owners. This is important here. And uh, the, African, uh, the Africans fight Spain and Britain. So France, <laughs> yeah, calls in Spain and Britain to help them. This is what France is doing, this little island in the Caribbean, they have, you know, and France is supposed to be the mighty army. Britain is supposed to be the mighty army. This is in the 1700s, this is the latter part of the 18, latter part of the, 1800, uh, of the 18th century, the 1700s, okay? This is what happens. And the two great powers at that time was France and Britain. And they had to call in Spain and Britain to help them. And you know what? The Haitians had kicked out the Spanish and they kicked out Britain as well. And Britain said, well, listen, this is your war, you France. You have to deal with that. These people are trained. These people are well organized. And this was going to bring about a major change in the region. The Spanish made a deal with Toussaint to fight the French. He accepted, provided that slaves would be free. So, He's being a strategist now. So he is saying, okay, I will fight alongside you, etc. But, you know, you have to um, set these slaves free and the island which joins Haiti, which is Dominica. So he is basically saying, well, look, this is what it's all about. So this is just an image of Toussaint and this is an image of Napoleon. Um, before I go on any further, all I want to say that Haiti had got his independence. Um, the, the, Haiti had got his independence in approximately 1804. Toussaint is tricked. Toussaint is said to basically go and speak to Napoleon's army uh, in order to negotiate something. Because what happens now, it bankrupts the French economy. Because the same year, the Louisiana Purchase comes in, where the French quarter in North America, known as Mississippi and Louisiana, were part of the French empire. The French had to sell that to the Anglo-Americans to financially recover, because three-fifths of the economy of France relied on Haiti. This is important here. So it buckled, literally, the French economy in 1804. Toussaint was basically led for negotiation. Dessalines and Henry Christophe told him, 
don't go, don't trust them, okay? Because they're gonna kidnap you and take you to France. He says, no, 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 no. They're good because Toussaint to a large extent was psychological, he was a Frenchman. He liked French culture, whatever the case may be, but you know, and, and he did have a softness for the French. And they were saying, look, we've lived with them all our lives. And we, they have never given us any favors. They've never done us any favors. So what happened was they went, Toussaint went, he went alone, he was tricked, he was tied up and he's brought to France in the Napoleon and he was tied up in a dungeon, cold dungeon, supposed to be butt naked until he dehydrated, he froze to death and he literally starved to death. This is what basically, that was his fate. Dessalines was elected the leader of Haiti. And this is the first time in a democratic country, it is a democratic country now, because they allowed voting for both male as well as females in the country. So females voted in, along with the males, Dessalines to become their leader. And that is what happened. So the first people or females to vote in the Western world were black women from Haiti, okay? So we need to look at this history because we're made to believe that the first time that women were able to vote or have some sort of political say was after 1920 in America and Britain. This is historically inaccurate isn't, and it's not true. Haiti is the first country. And then what happened was Haiti wanted to do business and it started, and what started happening, all types of things started to take place after 1804. And this is one of the reasons why Britain and America decided to um, pass the Slave Trade Act, okay? Three years later, three years later they passed it. They didn't pass it because they woke up and said, let's do the right thing. They passed it because of the Haitian Revolution and more and more revolution was taking place in Grenada, in, in St. Kitts, Trinidad, Barbados, Jamaica, you know, and the list just goes on and on, you know, St. Lucia, all these islands start to erupt now and they want to take that element of what Haiti did of becoming republics. This is why they passed the act. This is why they passed it. It wasn't because they woke up, woke up one day and they were doing us a favor. And the other reason was, was in Africa in 1807, there was a Sokoto Caliphate, which was run uh, by Uthman Danfodio. Okay, this is Nigeria, Lake Chad, all that area. So security was now being brought back into Africa. So you've got two major events to take place to, to, to force the slave trade, uh, to force the slave trade um, abolishment. It wasn't because they woke up well. They couldn't get into Africa now because of the Sokoto Caliphate. They don't teach this in history. But if you read about the Sokoto Caliphate, and the security came to the thing, it made it very difficult for Europeans to now capture and take in slaves. Because the other problem was that many of those were coming out later on as slaves were going into places like Jamaica and Brazil and all these other places, and they were causing ruptures. They were causing problems to the point where they said, we're not going to take more because they're coming over and they're instigating this. That was why they passed the 1807 Act. Okay, not what they're telling you, because only giving you one half of the story, like Bob Marley says, only half the story of what half the story has never been told. That's the story we should know. I've given you two days, 1804, 1807, the Sukkot Khalifat comes into being. And those two things culminated in them passing the act in Parliament, not because they woke up and they wanted to do the right thing. So slave rebellions increase in the 90, in the 1830s, and it gets even bigger and it intensifies even more now. So you start to see the likes of Abu Bakr Siddiq of Jamaica, who wrote the Quran from memory. He was a he was a doctor. He was a Mandinka, and he was speaking to a person by the name of Richard Madden. Now Richard Madden is supposed to be he was a magistrate sent to Jamaica, and he was based in Turkey. And what he noticed was when he was in Jamaica, he noticed these groups of Africans in Jamaica were speaking Arabic. So he basically started speaking Arabic to them and they started to get all excited because he was stationed in Turkey, so he knew a bit of Arabic. So then he started to find out that these individuals were leaders, they were, you know, they were leaders, they were scholars, they were doctors back in West Africa before they were forced into slavery by the British. 
And basically, uh, Abu Bakr had dreams of going back to his lands. Uh, he ended up going back to his land and settling there after the 1830s, in which Richard Madden, who was a British magistrate, was able to um, secure for him. A lot of people thought that with my name being Madden, that I was probably related to him. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I've done my research, et cetera, because they say, well, your name is Madden, and, you know, your name is also Abu Bakr, you're from, you know, your people are from Jamaica. Maybe there's some link there. But no, he only seemed to be there for about 12 months. Because when I read Richard Madden's um, journals or diaries, he only seemed to be there for 12 months to oversee certain things. But he did have a bit of sympathy for the African Muslims which were there. Then Sam Sharp, the Morant Bay Rebellion, takes place in 1831. We get the we, we get by here Brazil sparks off in 1831. So in the 1830s, things start to change. Okay? And then we start to find, and obviously Nat Turner in the, in the 1830s in America, in Virginia. So you're starting to see these are religious leaders, like as they are all religious leaders. Okay, they're all pastors and things who were trained by white people to keep their slaves down. They decide to come off the pulpit, go into the war, and to bring about those changes. This is what they wanted to do. And um, this, is, this is how this culminated in making change, where the British were forced to pass the abolition of slavery three years or two years after this. So it's not that they woke up one day and wanted to do the right thing. Plantations were burning. The amount of yields that was not coming into Britain. Because why? Because rich merchants who bought political power and all the rest of stuff was losing a large amount of money. This is why they had to abolish it. Okay? This is the truth. Huh? You know, this is the hidden truth which they're not telling people. You know? And we got the likes of Paul Bogle. You know, uh, this is during the 1860s. This is during the Victorian period, etc., where Queen Victoria refused to, because if they were supposed to abolish slavery 30 years before, why is it that black people are still working in Jamaica? Okay, there's other islands where I focus on Jamaica, are still working seven days a week for two days' pay, three years after the abolition. So we move from physical slavery to wage slavery. And she wrote a letter back to Jamaica to one of the governors, basically saying, Paul Bogle, um, no, you're, you're there, you're supposed to work for the, for the queen, uh, for the monarchy, we rely on your, we rely on your labor for our wealth, for our lifestyle. Read the letters by Queen Victoria. And Paul Bogle, in actual fact, is a descendant of a woman who was a reggae singer um, by the name of Janet Kay. That's Janet Kay's great, great uncle. Her name is Bogle. Okay, so you have a person in Britain, lives in London, who's a singer. She was a lover's rock singer back in the 1970s and 80s. She still does singing now. And her name is Janet Kay. She's from this family, Paul Bogle. He's a, he's a ancestor. And then I see there, these are the islands which really erupted. North America, Nat Turner. Barbados, I think it was Mohammed Bath. I think if my name is Sergio right. Trinidad, there was another cer certain person. In Jamaica, you had the likes of Abu Bakr, and in Brazil was the was Bahia Brazil. I can't remember the names of the two main people that started off the revolt, but that was a Muslim revolt, and they were originally from Nigeria and Cameroon. They came there in order to instigate the rebellion because they found many letters written in Arabic where the slaves were able to read and all these other sort of things. Because in 1807 onwards, the Sokoto Empire was sending letters. Okay, because they lost security. That's why they banned it. They were sending letters into Jamaica. We have the Wafika in Jamaica, which was sent by Uthman Dan Fodio himself, the leader of the Sokoto Empire in Jamaica. Even letters that came from Uthman Dan Fodio was being sent to the likes of Trinidad and Brazil. And those letters have been, has been, has been uh, forged in a sense that they're in the possessions of the different museums. So this is a type of communication which was taking place during the 1830s. Things were blazing and changing in the Caribbean islands. So if you got some time, I think I've got some time, probably 15, 20 minutes, just have a look at some of these things, what takes place in Britain. So you've got the likes of William Wilberforce, most of you know he's the MP, he's the MP of Hull, he's part of the abolition movement. He's against the slave trade, but not slavery. Let's get something thing because people confuse the slave trade 
and think slave trade and slavery is one and the same. No, slave trade is a forced migration of black people from Africa to the new world, whether it was the Caribbean islands, North America, or even Britain. This is what it was. Slave system or slavery was the physical system of exploitation, social degradation within the Caribbean islands. So there's a difference. So he was against the slave trade, not slavery. Because there was a person in his country by the name of Thomas Claxon, who is really the real hero. Thomas Claxon was the one who was going to the ports of uh, Liverpool, uh, Bristol, and he was seeing the conditions in which black people were coming in. He was totally disgusted. He was writing this thing down, giving it to Wilberforce, who was like the front man, to argue these things out in Parliament. I don't even think that Wilberforce ever saw the conditions of black people which came into London or Bristol or Liverpool. I don't think he actually saw it with himself. I think he actually smelt the, um, the air, etc., the stench, but I don't think he actually saw with his own eyes. It was all documented evidence, okay, that came from Thomas Clarkson himself. He was at, Wilberforce was also opposed to the Haitian Revolution. So he believed in the ballot, not the bullet, okay? The ballot, that we have to wait for good white folks in Britain to make those changes to make our lives better, rather than us rising up and making those changes ourselves. A bit of agency to bring about autonomy. He was totally against the Haitian Revolution. So it's clear he was not really, he, he was supporting the slave system to some extent. How can you be against a revolution for change and you're supposed to be arguing for that same change in Parliament. It couldn't have been. His focus was on the slave trade, the conditions that they were coming in, not slavery. White abolitionists saw slaves as humans, but not their equals. And this is important. Not all the abolitionists, okay, they had some sort of thing where they actually started seeing us as humans. We're not animals and we're not chattel or cattle or whatever the case may be. Yeah, we, then we, are, we are now, um, yeah, so we're humans now, but we're not their equals. And this is what exists in the 21st century. Even though we're seen as humans, we're not seen as the average equal within Western society, with Britain or America. So this is where this tradition's understanding comes from. So he ended up uh, addressing Parliament to end slave trading and trade with Africa instead as commercial partners. So that's a good thing that Wilberforce does. Let's give him credit where credit is due. He said, you know, let's stop the trade. Let's stop exploiting the resources, the minerals, the commodities, and all that merchandise that's coming out of Africa. It's their commodities, resources, minerals. Let's trade with them directly. This is what he's basically saying. But we know what takes place in the 1880s at the Berlin Conference, where, where all those European nations come together for the so-called scramble for Africa. Okay, and we, uh, we know how that comes about and the reason why that comes about. So Wilberforce, give credit where credit is due. He was against our freedom when we were, when he was coming from bottom up, he believed in a top down, okay, thing. But we had to wait, it was a slow process. You've got to argue, you know, the ballots. No, the bullets, that is the way. Because that is what America did. When America signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776, and they kicked the British out, et cetera. They didn't get the respect that they deserved from European nations. The first nation to accept America's independence approximately two to three years later, okay, was, 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 was the country of Morocco. Morocco, okay, it was a Muslim country that accepted uh, America's declaration of independence. So it is clear that the Europeans stood against that, um, against America as a sovereign nation, state, etc., within the so-called Western world now. So here is just an image. I am not a man and a brother. Because the, the amount of people who are illiterate in this country couldn't read. So they have to read that because the abolition movement now is trying to bring to the attention of the average person on the street, the average citizen in Britain, what is really happening? These people have been dehumanized, especially the men. 
because it was a time where women weren't really part of the discourse, okay? So we got to go back to the time of why this is what it is. So I am not a man and a brother. In other words, I have a family, okay? Trying to appeal to the spiritual and religious affiliation of the British people or the British public and to bring back his humanity in the sense that he is a man, not an animal, okay? He should be chained up and controlled. And then we got the likes of Orlando Equiano, who wrote a fantastic book about his voyage, about his journey. He was stolen from Nigeria by the British, put on a slave ship as a young boy with his sister. His sister ended up going to one place and he ended up going to another. And this was a common scenario in the Middle Passage. Sometimes they would take complete families. Then they were taken to a Spanish port, to a Dutch port, to an English port, and they were separated. This is why in our community, the African Caribbeans and the African Americans, the thing that we call, we call ourselves is brothers and sisters, because that person might be. You might have, your, your great-great-grandfather might have been the brother of my great-great-grandmother. This is what we, this is why we do that, you know? So it's not from a religious perspective. When we say, oh, brothers, in America, they say brothers, I mean, because you, you could be related to one another. This is how this idea of thing comes out. And the other thing is, why do in the Caribbean community and in the American community, when we finish off a sentence, we always say man. Man, 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 because we were called boys during servitude. And we are reinforcing this thing as a man because we were never allowed to be a man. What's happening, man? You know, come on, man, etc. etc. This is what it comes out. So our linguistic expressions, yeah, it actually um associates itself with the conditions we come from and what we're trying to replace in order to reinforce a strong identity for ourselves. And that's why we say it. You know, even black women say sisters. They don't necessarily mean my blood sister. They mean that that woman over there happens to have the same skin color as me. We might be sisters because her great-great-grandmother uh, may be related to my great-great-great-grandmother who were taken on the slave ships and they were brought to different places. And this is how the pan-African movement comes into being now with the scattered or the diasporan black populations outside the African continent. So you can see how all these things are combinating in together to unite us. And Marcus Garvey, who came at the beginning, literally at the beginning of the 20th century, is going to solidify and synthesize all this together by creating the largest mass movement, you know, ever in history between what they, some, some say 30, 30 million. Some say six million, some say nine million. In all different, at all different chapters, all around different countries around the world. And then when independence came into the African continent um, from the 1950s and 60s, you always hear the slogans of Marcus Garvey. His books was read, the philosophies and opinions of Marcus Garvey. Um, and Krumah of Ghana, okay, read his book, okay, and then he became the leader. Kenneth Kohunda, Okay, it was another person who read his books. The ANC as well read his books and they solidified and became a movement at the turn of the 20th century when the British literally pulled out and allowed the trekkers, who now call themselves Africans, to steal the country and to give black people so-called townships and pariah group status. This is Thomas Clarkson. Thomas Clarkson is really the hero for the abolition movement, really. He was almost just going around collecting information and giving it to Wilberforce. Unfortunately, you hear more about Wilberforce than you do about Thomas Clarkson, but you've got to give this man credit. This man went traveling, he used his own money to travel to London, to Bristol, to Liverpool, and to see the conditions, and to get black people who were already in Britain who were slaves, who spoke those local tongues and languages, to speak to these slaves coming off those ships, to talk about the, the conditions, where they came from. This man documented everything, okay? He's a real hero behind what change that takes place in parliaments, okay? He, you know, Wilberforce is just a mouthpiece. But this was the person that collected all the information who, unfortunately, 
has been written out of history to a large extent. He has, and it's unfortunate that this happens. Even amongst white people, they do this. When somebody contributes something to the state of black people or uh, trying to enlighten people about the true conditions of something, they want to put them on the, on the wayside or on the sideline. And the other thing which I will mention here is that even though he helped the campaign for change, etc., he actually met Henry Christoph. Henry Christoph was one of the revolutionary leaders or commanders in the Haitian Revolution, who actually came and settled in Britain. Okay, and so when Haiti becomes a nation state, etc., some people decide to move to other countries because things are not well in the country. You start to see that France ends up imposing reparations on Haiti in 1824, 1825. And they take up all this mahogany because French were, the French were just addicted to wooden tables now, mahogany, etc. So the analysis was caused of a lot of these earthquakes in Haiti. That was the reparations they had to pay. And what has happened, all the European nations who are former slave traders have watched Haiti suffer. Because Haiti, how dare you become an independent state, allow your women to vote, okay? Kick us out and think you're going to survive? Every country, America, you know, France, Britain, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Germany, okay? Uh, Holland, the Dutch, the Danes, the Swedes, all those countries have collaborated together to ensure that Haiti stays poor. There's a, a deliberate attempt to starve those people. How dare you gain freedom from us? This is why, this is why Haiti is in the situation it is today. We need to read the history and understand it. They're collaborating because these are old wounds which they want to maintain um, some control over. So Haiti is a problem. You even know what's taking place where Haitians have tried to sail to America, okay? And many of them are drowning in the sea. And yet people who come not too far from Haiti is Cuba can actually go there and step in. It's about the color of the skin. And not just that, it's about what these people did. What these people did was, was terrible. How dare you defeat the greatest armies of the time, Spain, Britain, and France, and then gain independence. Okay, we're going to bleed you dry. And we've seen this taking place. So now you understand why Haiti is in the state is because Haiti is supposed to be a healthy country. It should be wealthy. And they starved it to death. Because if the French economy fell because of Haiti, okay, and then the Louisiana Purchase has to come in, where France and Napoleon has got to send to sell the states of Louisiana and Mississippi, okay, to the Anglo-Americans okay, which is bolstering the French economy, why can internally Haiti's resources bolster up its economy? And this is because there's been, there's been a deliberate attempt since 1804 to starve that country into submission. That is the reason why that is happening. And that is the reason why if you go to most of the Caribbean islands today, you notice that the poorest people in those countries are black people. The wealthiest and the richest people are white people. And they've made sure that they've maintained this. This is no accident. This is being created by design. So the reality of the situation is that these are the remnants of slavery, whereby the old plantocracy are there, okay? The merchants are there. The men of profession are there. The hotel, the landlord owners now, the states, and they're owning hotels and the airports and all these other type of things. That's the jobs they do now. Even when I talked about, I think it was last week when I talked about the Bay of Pigs invasion and because Castro, because the plantocracy in, the plantocracy in Cuba, those people that was trying to fight because when Castro came in, he kicked out America and he kicked out the gangsters, the mafia, he kicked them out and they were really upset about this. And, the other, and a lot of the, the um, Cubans fled, the landowners fled. Those landowners who were working with CIA, FBI, the American government, and the American army were the children and grandchildren of the Cuban uh, planters. They were the grandchildren of the slave owners. So this is what we have to understand about this, just to, to wrap this up. Really so I'm going to do, I'm going to stop uh, now and, and okay. probably invite some questions, etc. That um, would be great. Yeah, I think we've got a few. Um, just as we mentioned earlier, someone mentioned, is there a clear link between the view of drepetomania and modern day white saviorism? So I think 
as I say, what I think they might be referring to is um, the dependence on white people, the associations between that. Can you find a link between the two there? I can't find a link really and truly, but let's just think. So drapetomania is to do more with a slave not wanting to be a slave and running away from that horrific system. Where the white savior thing comes into it, I think there may be association, but I wouldn't say a link. There's an association in the sense that this is another aspect of uh, Cartwright's understanding about black autonomy, okay? About black autonomy if they were to get freedom because they're childlike or baby-like, they can handle freedom, the best position for them are slaves. So I think that's how the two things probably merge together, but I think they're two different perspectives yeah. of the autonomy of black people and black people being enslaved, not once to be enslaved. So fathers had no autonomy over their children, but neither did the mothers. Men had to endure wives being raped rather than women had to endure being raped. Please could you explain why you have framed that point that way? So I suppose the emphasis in the narrative is on the men and their suffering rather than the female side of that? No, I didn't. If you look at the images of rape, I showed all females. Mm -hmm. I didn't show males. I showed all females the physical images and looking at the female... Uh, systemic experience yeah okay and I think I'm, I made that pretty clear I think I came back when I said that black men looked after the you know the, the, the children who were raped and they taught them how to fish and they cultivated them because many of the white fathers raping these women were either selling their kids into slavery put them on auction blocks or they were being killed by their wives or sisters on the plantation I think I think I made it clear I may have convoluted or put a lot of stuff within the narrative but I think if you go back and listen to it I think you can pick those nuances out yeah. okay and I did emphasize that uh, so the rape was a female experience it was horrific and I'm not trying to say that the men were affected they've affected the men but it would affect the woman first first and foremost and unfortunately what came out of that was the fact that um, this was a system that was sanctioned by the British government or the American government at the time. And, um, you know, right up until the 1970s, you know, so, you know, especially in America, you know, up, up until the 1970s. So it's unfortunate yeah. that that was a reality of such a, a, such a system. So I, th yeah. I hope I've answered that question. Yeah, definitely, I think so. And then I think another question was, what is the role of religion in all of this? I suppose maybe you could link that to the role of the church and the Pope, um, because he had, I suppose, a lot of responsibility with signing off licenses to do with slavery. Yeah. Well, I think, I think there's a couple of things you can say about religion. I don't attack religion, and I see religion from what it is. There's a difference between Christians and Christianity. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I need to make that clear. However, some... Christians unfortunately bought into white, white supremacy, slavery, and all and all these other type of things by using a quotation that these people who are slaves are the son of Ham, they are cursed by God, okay, and they're supposed to serve their brothers who are white. This is what was being taught. There was a Bible for black people in the West Indies and in America, which stipulated this. And we were taught this continuously and perpetually throughout slavery, okay? However, there were some people who were practicing Christians who did not, um, what do you call it? Who did not um, enjoy the fact that slavery existed and they tried to speak out, okay? However, their narrative hasn't really come to the forefront, unfortunately, but those narratives are there. You know, the narrative which is important was the narratives of like of, of the Holstons, which are the merchants, the Pictons, who were the planters, and the men of profession, who were your doctors and your lawyers and all these other people who was making systems to keep black people perpetually enslaved and in servitude. And I think they're the narratives which become more important when we look at slavery in that four to five hundred year period. Mm -hmm. You don't, it, as I suppose, the destruction of culture, does that include religion as well? Because often like, I've heard that the opinion back then was Catholicism equaled civilization, and anything other than any other religion other than Catholicism was to do with barbaric 
barbaric barbaric barbaricism and savagery well, so barbaric, barbarity could happen in any case so give an example if you look at what took place in 1492 you've got the catholic nation ferdinand and isabella the day that columbus leaves to go on his so-called explorations or discoveries they start the inquisition okay they're torturing jews and christians and then what happens then? Martin Luther comes in 1517 and he poses the Protestant Reformation. That comes into play now. So the only religion at the time was, was, was Catholicism in Europe. There was elements of Orthodox Christianity, but the vast majority of them were Catholics. Protestantism don't come into existence to approximately 1517. And then what you start to see, the people start to leave the church, etc. And then they started to adopt similar principles. These are the sons of Ham. So it wasn't just the Catholics who were doing it. The Protestants started to do it as well. And they started to justify slavery and enslavement, you know, whether they were in their own countries at home or whether they were in the Caribbean or whether they were actually in North America. So religion didn't really play a role. The people who happened to be religious played that role. And I want to make that clear. There's a difference between the people who practice the religion. It's different between the, the practitioners who practice the religion or not the religion and the, you know, the book, the principles. It's about the principles or the adherences. The principles are what the book says. The adherences are what people do. And they're both different. And many of them were not following the biblical texts, etc. So we have to acknowledge that there's just some bad apples out there who didn't really practice what they should have been practicing, unfortunately. So uh, that's the role that religion played. But I, what I will say that religion did play a, a, a major role within the so-called abolition movements. It was a bitter taste because many of them within those churches, etc., were merchants and planters and investors. You know, this this is true. So they, they compromised their religion and faith and they were told to try to change things, etc. But the important thing at the time was wealth or money for them, unfortunately. So I hope I have answered uh, those questions about uh, the role that religion plays during the enslavement period. Hello? Hello, I'm, I'm back. I don't, I don't know, Izzy seems to have lost connection. Um, All right. So let's, we'll, we'll end it there. I'd really like to thank you, Abu Bakr. It's been a really interesting set of four lectures. Yeah. Just to remind everyone that they are recorded and they'll be on the University YouTube channel. I think the first three are already there. Yeah. I think in the chat I've put, if you have suggestions for future events, because one of the things as a group we want to do is to not limit black history to this month and to actually think about black history as being central to history. So if you have suggestions for future events, email us, I put the email address on there. And, I'd, yeah. and, and most of all, I'd like to really thank Izzy, Awa and Jessica, who are part of the Student Race Equality Steering Group for working through this and organizing it and chairing the various meetings. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Abubakar. Okay, thank you, and thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning up. Thanks, thanks a lot.